Welcome to the Jack Weston MCAT Podcast with your hosts, Eric Olson and Jaden Garcia. All right, welcome back to the Jack Weston MCAT Podcast. I am host, I'll give myself host number two status, Eric. I'm here with my boy <laughs> Jaden, host number one. Hi, everyone. How's, how's everything going? Things are good, man. Um, gearing up for another 28 hour shift here. Uh, oh in the room, but um, it's good. I've been on this rotation where, you know, we have this repeating schedule in the surgical ICU where I do a half day and then I do a full 28 hours and then I get a day off and then another day off and then rinse and repeat. And it's been a really good time to be with my family. Um, you know, when you're there, it's very busy and hectic. You've yep. been in ICU. I'd be curious to hear how things are going, but it's good. Yeah, that sounds pretty daunting. I I just took uh, all the residents have to take the ACGME survey every year or the uh, I guess I don't know what it stands for, like Association Council of Graduate Medical Education or something like that. And I took it yesterday. And one of the questions was like, have you had to take call for more than 24 hours at a time? And I was like, no, I've never <laughs> I've never had a shift that was longer than like. Uh, I think we do like 14 hour shifts once in a while here. So it's nothing. It pales in comparison to what you're doing. <laughs> All things to consider when uh, people are figuring out what they want to do with their lives, which ends up being fairly relevant to what we'll end up discussing today. But take that as a blessing and run with it. I mean, you've been in the critical care unit as well, right? Like I have. We've, we've been ICU brothers. during. Yeah. This I've been in the medical ICU, which is... I guess I haven't been in the surgical ICU before, so I was going to say it's different. It's very different, but uh, I, I imagine, I guess, that it's it's pretty different. Um, you know, we have a lot of support as as residents. Um, you know, we have senior residents who work with us, and then there are critical care attendings who are always just a call away. So that's it's nice, um, but I'm just coming off a week of nights, actually. Nope. It feels like things have been going wrong at night, and people are people are sick. It's been kind of sobering for me honestly i don't know if i've worked with patients quite this sick before so it's uh you know i'm, I'm learning a lot for sure and yeah. it feels good to be helping people who are really sick but at the same time it's been it's been pretty heavy yeah i uh, for all our listeners the icu is just a different part of the hospital i mean i can't emphasize enough what you said about people being sick there's so much medicine going on you know, usually people have one problem or so in the hospital that we're thinking about. And when somebody's in the ICU, most of the time it's like 20, yeah. 20 problems. Probably. And there's a lot of water that's muddied by these problems and, and how to fix it can be hard. Um, it's funny, budding dermatologist here, one of our patients is like critically ill with ARDS um normally we don't take care of that in the surgical icu we'd go to the icu you have been in but she was going to be put on ecmo um which for our listeners is uh essentially a, a heart lung or both heart and lung bypass um for her failing lungs and that can only be placed by surgeons typically so she came in for evaluation of that and ultimately we didn't need to put her on that but she's developed this rip roaring infection on top of it. And uh, we've essentially run out of antibiotics we can give her because she had dress syndrome. Uh, oh, yeah. Which, uh, again, for our listeners, uh, is a dermatologic problem um, given reaction to certain drugs, offending agents. And it's been really hard. We've been battling back and forth between our dermatologists and our infectious disease doctors. Because every time she has a problem, we're like, is this ongoing dress issues or is this infection? And yeah. so we've been using our dermatologists in the IC. <laughs> interesting. We the two interesting things. We should probably get to our subject material. We're <laughs> talking about specialty choice today. Mm -hmm. um, but number one, we actually don't have dermatologists on call at our hospital. If there's a skin problem, they call infectious disease. And that's like... Oh. That's that's our resource, which you know is, is pretty good backup. <laughs> um, 
And the other, the other interesting thing is actually the ECMO patients, which uh, again, we won't get into it, but uh, extracorporeal membrane oxygenation, heart lung machine for people whose hearts and lungs don't work. Um, the ECMO patients at our hospital come to the medical ICU. So that's interesting. Oh, really? They are the um, obviously placed by surgeons. Surgeons? Uh, actually, yeah. I'll, I'll rephrase. Um, there are in for, for ECMO patients, uh, sometimes they always have venous cannulas, so big tubes that go into the vein to pull blood. Um, and then sometimes there are arterial cannulas uh, as well. And the venous cannulas at our hospital are placed by critical care attendings, so medicine doctors who have done critical wow. care fellowships. And then if there's an arterial cannula, then that's only placed by, I, I want to say, it's either vascular surgery or CT surgery, cardiovascular yeah. surgery, I'm not sure. It's a complication of that if that goes south. Like yeah. you gotta have somebody who can operate and fix yeah, that. <laughs> exactly. you gotta be able to open it up. That's pretty anyway, cool. very interesting stuff. So so let's talk. We want to talk today a little bit. Um, for all you listeners, we want to talk about our specialty choice and kind of what that looks like uh as two freshly I guess I was gonna say freshly minted interns, but we're I guess we're almost PGY twos at this point. So yeah. Um but Jaden, tell us a little bit about kind of what what your specialty is and, uh, you know, maybe what other fields are related to it, uh, some of the things that you do. Sure. So my field has many names. The most common is ear, nose, and throat surgery. Um, I think the most proper term for the specialty is otolaryngology head and neck surgery. So it's kind of a, a mouthful, but essentially we are surgeons who operate on almost everything above the clavicles minus the eyes and most of the brain and there are actually some exceptions to that i mean i've cut it out cut out an eyeball and i've cut out pieces of brain already in my first year so there is some exception to that but for the most part those two organs we don't operate on um, primarily without you know an ophthalmologist there or a neurosurgeon there but um, we are both the medical and surgical specialists for that area of the head and neck. And that's one of the things I love about what we do and a little bit different. For example, you know, you have cardiologists who are medicine doctors who specialize in the heart, uh, but they don't operate. They're, they're not surgeons. They have a surgical counterpart, you know, cardiothoracic surgeons and and so those two bounce back and forth, um, or I should say bounce patients back and forth between these two specialties for various problems. Um, for problems that happen in the ear, nose, throat, uh, jaw, um, skull, trachea, esophagus, at least the upper esophagus, you know, we're kind of the only ones managing those patients, uh, even if it is a non-surgical problem, which I think is really fun. Um, we have like six subspecialties within our field. So once you finish training as a head and neck surgeon, you can choose to practice general head and neck surgery, um, or you can go into a subspecialty. Uh, the subspecialties are facial plastics and reconstructive surgery. So that's dealing with patients who have various um, cosmetic needs or reconstructive needs like cleft lip, cleft palate, um, face transplant on the extreme side, patients who have oh, crazy awesome. gunshot wounds or cool. burns that need to have their faces transplanted. That's something we do as well. Um, and many other things uh, for the sake of time, I'll stop there. Uh, there's also um, head and neck cancer surgery. So patients who have cancer in their nose, in their mouth, in their throat, in their neck, um, in their esophagus, at least the upper part undergo pretty big surgery, sometimes up to 20, 25 hours if needed to take out the, the surgery or excuse me, the, the tumor and uh, fix the defect that's left behind, whether that's with a leg or with a scapula or an arm. We kind of use various parts of the body to put people back together. Um, there's uh, laryngology, which mainly deals with upper airway problems. There's uh, neurootology, which deals with uh, tumors of the skull base, so where your brain sits on top of your skull. Those are really, really big surgeries as well. Um, 
There's sleep surgery. So patients who have sleep apnea that need to have their airway reconstructed so that they don't have that problem anymore. There's rhinology, um, which primarily deals with the nose and the sinuses. And th- that, that's mainly it. I may have left off one or two, but that's kind of the essence of what we do. And it's really, really exciting. And they're really, really big surgeries and really, really small surgeries. So happy to talk about it more, but I'll throw it back to you, Eric. I have to ask because <laughs> at one point I was, I remember when I was in Brazil, I don't know if I've mentioned this, but I spent a couple of years in Brazil mm-hmm. and I remember walking past this sign for a physician and it was an ENT doctor is, is the end of the story. But on the sign, it said the, the name Odo Reno laryngologist. Mm-hmm. And I remember I was like, I got to learn, I got to be able to say this in Portuguese. Like this is, this is impressive. So Odo, Odo, Odo Reno laryngologista, I think is what it was. <laughs> My question is like, sometimes you see, or sometimes I've seen Odo Reno or Rhino laryngologist. And other times it's just Odo laryngologist. Like, is there any kind of difference? Or is that just like, that's just terminology? Just terminology. Some people have really tried to hold on to the name otorhinolaryngologist, uh, like the Mayo Clinic. That's what they mm-hmm. call uh, their surgeons um, at Cleveland Clinic, just not too far away. They don't use that at all, and they just say head neck surgery to not confuse oh, yeah. people. Mm-hmm. So it really depends, but just, they're all the same doctor. <laughs> gotcha. Okay. And the Odo, Odo being ear. Rhino bring nose and nose. laryngo being larynx, right? Throat. Yep. Throat and larynx. All right, cool. <laughs> um, well, you're not asking, but I can tell you about dermatology if you want. Yeah. Tell us about dermatology. It's what uh, you do? it's a little <laughs> bit more accessible, maybe. I think I feel like ENT is kind of like, what is that? And what are those guys doing? <laughs> dermatology is a little more straightforward, you know, treating diagnosing and treating disorders of the hair, skin, and nails. Which ends up being a lot of skin and some hair and some nails. Um, but you know, it's what's interesting. I think about it is that it's a very visual field, and it it kind of has that in common with radiology, honestly, and pathology are the three really visual. Like you need to use your eyes um, to be able to do this um, this specialty. And I remember I I had an interview for for residency, and one of the interviewing physicians was like. In dermatology, you need to have a really good eye. And when was the first time you you recognized that you had a good eye? And I was like, what, what kind of question is that? Like, <laughs> I don't know. So um, anyway, um, I think they actually there are actually a fair amount of of similarities between dermatology and otolaryngology, at least the way that you're presenting it. You know, both uh, medical and surgical management, although admittedly the surgeries in dermatology are, you know, not quite as extreme uh, or significant as the surgeries in otolaryngology. Um, But I think, you know, on a base level, we think of dermatology as, you know, medical physicians of the skin. And so you talked about dress syndrome, which is a cutaneous side effect to, uh, you know, like an adverse effect to medication. Um, those are the sorts of things that dermatologists can ma- can manage. Um, side effects to medications. We look at um, you know some of the basic things that we see very frequently are like psoriasis and eczema, um, allergies, um, you know fungal infections, other infections. That's why, as I mentioned, like we don't even have dermatologists at our hospital. We call the infectious disease doctors because there are so many c- cutaneous manifestations to lots of infectious diseases. Um, so I think there are a couple of things I want to highlight, and it's similar to what you kind of said. One is that we are both kind of diagnosticians and uh, treating physicians as well. And so we, you know, someone will come in, we'll look at them, we'll get some history and make a decision about what, what we think the diagnosis is, and then we'll give them treatment options as well. And so we kind of own the skin in that in that manner. There's no... Or I shouldn't say no, but like there's less working in concert. Like I'm going to send you to this specialist to take care of this thing, and I'm going to take care of this other thing. It's like you have a problem with your skin. I'm gonna I'm gonna tell you what it is, and then I'm gonna tell you how to fix it. Um, so I like that. You know, there's there's both diagnosis and there's treatment. There's medical management. There's surgical management, and so there's some breadth to what you're able to do as a dermatologist. And then there are some subfields as well that I think afford you even more breadth as you start to think about you know being more specialized in one area or another. I think if someone's interested in, you know, medical dermatology, that's kind of 
just being a being a general dermatologist. Uh, no fellowship training is required for that. And we do treat, you know, rheumatologic disease as well, psoriatic arthritis, um, uh, like vasculitides and soft tissue stuff. Um, and so there, there's a lot of like kind of complex medical dermatology that you can get into if that's kind of, you know, what interests you in the field. And in fact, there are residency programs that are uh, combined internal medicine and dermatology for for individuals who are you know interested in hospital dermatology, for example, or some of that more complex medical dermatology, um, like bullous vesicular bullous diseases, bullous pemphigoid, pemphigus vulgaris. Those are some of the things that we work with as well. Right. Um, there's surgical dermatology, so that's you know procedural things, and in particular Mohs surgery, which is uh, treatment of cancers in kind of high real estate, uh, high value real estate areas, like on the face, mm. on the ears, on the neck, on the hands, on the feet, um, on the lower legs, things like that. Um, and then that's also used on the trunk and on the arms uh, and the upper legs as tumors are, you know, kind of more aggressive. And as they're bigger um, than, than most surgery can be indicated as well. And that's kind of a whole other discussion um, but it's like taking taking a cancer out layer by layer until you have gotten it all and you like check it under the microscope as you go to make sure there are no malignant cells left and then reconstruction as well. And actually, as you know, Jaden, that's one of the areas that ENTs and dermatologists will frequently work together is if there's a, you know, if there were a big tumor on someone's, you know, temple right here and you had to take out a lot of tissue to get rid of that tumor, then sometimes ENT will work in concert with a dermatologist to do the reconstruction there depending on you know, if there needs to be a flap or a graft or like a big chunk of tissue transposed onto a different area. So, and those could be terrible. I mean, just absolutely terrible. Like the dermatologist will take out most of somebody's nose and then, you know, we see them in clinic and they need like a big procedure to rebuild that. Like, yeah, I've seen, I've seen a nose rebuilt like they took out the whole nose and then they used like ear cartilage to reconstruct <laughs> like the rim of the nose and it can get pretty interesting. Um, there's pediatrics in dermatology, so you can specialize in that and you work with children with genodermatoses and, you know, other genetic defects and things that manifest with cutaneous problems. Um, there's pathology in dermatology. You know, we all learn a pretty decent amount of pathology and then you can specialize in, and just be a pathologist. If you decide you don't want to see patients anymore and you just want to look at, look at cells under the microscope, um, there's, there's, there's that option as well. And then, you know, there's, there's cosmetic dermatology as well. And we work with plastic surgeons. Um, you know, we don't do quite as, uh, quite as significant of surgical procedures, but, you know, dermatologists do do facelifts, they do blepharoplasties or eyebrow lifts. And of course we do a lot of like Botox and filler and things like that. And so there's a fair amount of kind of breadth for you to be able to specialize. And, and that's one of the things that I loved about it was not only just owning the skin and kind of being the, being the master of the skin um, and that organ system, but also being able to kind of choose down the road, like maybe I want to see less patients and I'm going to do some pathology, or maybe I really like the surgery and I want to do more of that. Um, and being able to have the the liberty to kind of do what you want is one of the beautiful things about it as well. Speaking of seeing patients, I was going to ask you, I almost see dermatologists as like exclusively consultants in the inpatient world. You know, medical school, you get so much inpatient. Yeah. There's this whole outpatient realm. And we know dermatologists are just all over in the outpatient realm to take care of people. But at least in the hospitals I've been exposed to, like dermatologists don't have their own primary patients, meaning like they're the only ones, you know, caring for the patient or the ones responsible to admit the patient and discharge the patient and make sure they have like follow up care and all these things. I was going to ask you, is that like widespread the hospitals you've been in do dermatologists ever kind of carry their own patient list or are okay. they always just consultants i will i will just before i answer i'll just back you up and i think this can be a hard concept to understand as a pre-medical student i unless you have some you know experience in the hospital which i certainly didn't and so you know if i was listening to you five years ago i'd be like no idea what jaden's saying I'm just <laughs> <go ahead." laughs> but like yeah there are in, in the hospital there are primary services and so you know most of the most of the patients in the hospital are cared for by hospitalists or internal medicine doctors who take care of patients in the hospital and 
you know, they're treating patients with infections, they're treating patients who have asthma exacerbations, and they're treating patients who have, you know, I don't want to say run of the mill, but like basic medical disease that can be treated pretty reasonably simply in the hospital. And then when patients have more specialized disease, they have really bad heart failure, for example, like then they'll go to the cardiologist service and the cardiologist is responsible for them. They're like number one, taking care of this patient, everything about them. Maybe they have, I don't know, I'm sure you guys have a service that you admit people to, although I don't really know what those patients would be in for. Maybe after like a big head and neck surgery, then they'll be on the ear, nose and throat service or something like that. Um, maybe they had a stroke and they'll be on the neurology service. And so kind of depending on what your principal pathology is or the reason you're in the hospital, then you'll be on one service or another of mm -hmm. a different specialty. Um, like I said, Jaden, I mean, at this hospital, we don't even have, we don't even have consultant dermatologists. And so, um, I don't think, I can't think of a hospital that I've been to, which, you know, I've done dermatology rotations at four hospitals none of them had like an inpatient service where they were the number one treating physician. And honestly, that's one of the things and I'll, you know, I know you're not asking, but just to note uh, something that I think is important to recognize in yourself as you start thinking about specialties. Um, and I think, you know, we start thinking about specialties when we're, when we're in college, like before we even start medical school, it's like the thing that we're, what do you want to be when you grow up? Like, I want to be a brain surgeon. It's not necessarily a doctor. You're already thinking ahead to the specialty. And so when you start to get really serious and into medical school and you're really thinking about, you know, this is a choice that I'm going to make that I can't go back from. It's, it's what, it's what I'm going to be doing for the rest of my life. You know, there's no switching over in medicine unless you want to redo residency. And one of the things that I didn't think of initially that ended up being kind of a, a larger factor in my choice was, was being in the hospital or not. You know, I think a lot of specialties are hospital based <clears throat> being a hospitalist, for example, <laughs> that you just work in the hospital and you take care of patients in the hospital. There are lots of services or specialties that you can pursue that are, you know, both in clinic and in the hospital, like ear, nose and throat surgery, for example, um, which I think you can make more of an outpatient specialty if you want, but you're probably seeing patients in clinic a few times, a few times, a few times a week, excuse me, and then having surgeries a couple days a week. And maybe some of those patients stay over in the hospital. And so there is some need to be kind of a, a hospital based physician in dermatology. That's just not the case. And, you know, I won't get into it too much, but I just didn't really like being in the hospital very much. It was not my favorite place to be. Um, I felt like I was happier and I was at my best when I was outside of the hospital. And so, you know, I respect it. I, I know that people need to work there and I'm glad that people do, but it, I just knew, you know, based on my experience and doing the rotations that I did, that I was happier and I felt better. And I, I felt like I was more myself when I was in the clinic space and seeing yeah. 30 or 40 patients a day, which lots of people hate. Um, and so, you know, if it came down to me going into the hospital to see a patient in the ICU with dress syndrome, I could certainly do that and I wouldn't have any problems, but I'd rather be based in an outpatient setting and seeing patients in clinic than being in the hospital itself. And so that was a big, maybe not a big part, but it was certain, it certainly played a part in kind of deciding where I wanted to go as far as my career went. Nobody really tells you that. I never, I can't recall at least somebody telling me, you know, when you're thinking about what you want to do in medical school, really pay attention to like what setting you're in and how you feel in those different settings, whether it's in the hospital, in a clinic, in the operating room, in a procedural suite, in, you know, various capacities. I, I just never really received that advice, but I think it's very important, especially as we're talking about this, like there are these some specialties are almost exclusively in one or the other, some mix. And I think it's worth our listeners thinking about that going into medical school. Like to your point, Eric, where are you at your best? Where do you feel the most comfortable? Um, which do you like going to work the most in? You know, all of these things are worth considering when you're trying to find out what you want to do, because not all the specialties are the same in that regard. And, and I will say, and I'm interested in your perspective on this, but what, another big question that I think <clears throat> flies a little bit under the radar, although maybe it's becoming more prevalent, is um, do you like taking care of patients that are sick or healthy? Yeah. And 
my whole life until I started medical school, when I thought of like someone being sick, because my experience was like, I was pretty healthy. My thought of like being sick was I have strep throat. Like someone who's sick has an infection, like a, like a, a treatable infection. But when we talk about in medicine, someone being sick or healthy, we're talking about like someone who's sick is in the ICU. Like that's where, that's where Jada and I are right now. We're treating like sick yeah. patients who have real problems, who are, you know, need intensive management, probably maybe like need a tube down their throat to help them breathe. Um, patients who are, you know, have bad cancer who are like just getting worse. You know, these are, these are people who are sick versus if someone comes to me in my dermatology clinic and they have a rash. They're probably not sick, sick, you know, like they have a problem that I can help them with, but they're not sick. And so they'll say to you in medical school, they'll be like, the f one of the first things you need to do when you walk in to assess a patient is like, are they sick or are they not sick? not sick? And it doesn't mean, you know, are they crazy or do they not have anything wrong with them? It's like, are they seriously ill or are they not seriously ill? And so that's another thing, you know, I, I thought a lot about hospital or no hospital. I also thought about sick versus not sick. And I think I, the reason I'm interested in your perspective is because I think you treat, you probably treat a lot of patients who are sick and a lot of patients who are not sick in the yeah. Um, in dermatology, we treat a lot of patients who are, who are not quite so sick. And, you know, there are some certain dermatologic emergencies that patients come in really sick with, but by and large, patients are pretty healthy. They often get better from the problems that they have. Um, and, you know, I, as I said, I've been in the ICU this month. It's been, it's been a formative experience. You know, I've learned a lot, um, but it has reinforced and, you know, nothing against ICU doctors, but it's reinforced that it's not, it's not where I want to be for my career. Um, you know, it's, it's been really hard for me. I think I, I have a tendency to over empathize. And so, you know, we have some, we have some young guys in the ICU right now who are doing really poorly and it's just, it is hitting me really hard. Mm -hmm. and so, you know, for me, not sick was the nice <laughs> <way. laughs> not seriously ill. Right. Yeah. But I don't know. What did you think about all that? Or did that come into your decision-making process at all? It's, I thought about it a lot as a medical student. I'm thinking about it even more now as I decide to subspecialize simply because as you mentioned, Eric, in my field, we take care of some of the sickest patients in the hospital and some of the least sick patients in the hospital. Yeah. And which subspecialty I choose will very much push me down one of those spectrums. And I go back and forth, right? This month at the end of it certainly has me questioning if I want to take care of very sick people. Yeah. I mean, we lost two patients on my first shift in the surgical ICU. One was a 27-year-old girl with no problems at all coming in, had influenza yeah, and died from... Um, acute respiratory distress syndrome. So I think this is very relevant for our listeners to think about. And um, I think what we're trying to highlight here is there are pros and cons to taking care of sick people. And there are pros and cons to taking care of primarily healthy people. The cons are sick people die. That's just the reality of it. Um, a lot of patients in the ICU die. The reward could be incredibly high for people who you get better and it's super satisfying if you can get them there. You also take a lot home with you. It's hard not to. I mean, Eric's pointing out this is weighing on him, but he's not physically in the hospital. It just really does impact you when you leave. And maybe some people are really good at keeping that at work. I'm not. So I definitely feel the weight of what happens with sick people. I think on the, the other side, the, the healthy people, you know, they tend to have very few complications that impact your quality of life, right? If a sick patient that you're primarily in charge of, as Eric was teaching us about primary teams, gets really sick, that might mean you have to leave your family to, to go in and take care of that person. On the other side, like healthy people tend to not have as many complications, so you don't see as much of that. You don't see too many dermatologists in the middle of the night crashing into the hospital because you know, somebody's dying. But but then, of course, if I just interject for just a moment. Of yeah, course, please. The, the converse of that is you could fix a million people with a very minor problem and it, it probably doesn't feel as good as saving someone's life, right? Right. right. And, and as a dermatologist, like we don't, we don't, 
you know, maybe once in a while, but there's less, there's less like consistent life saving happening right. in the pathology clinic as it is in the ICU because patients are sick and they need mm -hmm. life saving interventions. So it's, it's kind of like, I don't want to say high risk, high reward, but like high, the highs are high and the lows are low. Right. right. And some patients that you don't say, like we're talking mortality here with life and death, but dermatologists, ENT doctors, other people who also see patients who are fairly healthy can make a major impact on quality of life or morbidity, right? Yeah. And that some patients who live through their, you know, one problem or whatever, and they're not that sick can be like eternally grateful for their dermatologist or ENT doctor, or pulmonologist, whoever that helps them with that thing that maybe wasn't critically ill. So you'll see doctors all the time who take care of like not very sick people get flooded with patient gifts because their patients are super grateful. Um, so it's trade-offs, but I, I entirely, I think that's another nugget of information for those listening. Really think about the spectrum of sickness and, and where you like to be. Beautiful. Uh, you know, we've talked a little bit about, um, sick versus not sick. We've talked about hospital versus not hospital. Are there any other big dichotomies that you can think of, Jaden, that, that play into this decision? Or or do you want to just take us through some of your experience and kind of how you got to where you were? Yeah, I, I think the big one for me that kind of answers both parts of that, Eric, is surgery versus not surgery. There's no beating around the bush here. Surgical fields have a major um, implication on lifestyle. Uh, at least through the training process, at least through the training process. Once you finish training, you know, you finish med school, you finish residency, and you're now a practicing physician, it can vary a lot based on what surgical subspecialty you choose. Uh, some, it's almost like you're always going to be busy. A cardiac surgeon, no such thing as a part-time cardiac surgeon that doesn't really exist. But there are part-time ENTs. There are part-time urologists. There are part-time plastic surgeons. That happens. Um, but I think medical students should go into medical school pretty early on considering, do you want to be a diagnostician and, or do you want to be a surgeon? And I know there's a mix between those two, right? There are diagnosticians, internal medicine doctors, cardiologists that do procedures, but they're not surgeons and they don't, being a surgeon means a lot of things. It means you have at least a a five-year residency um, compared to a three-year internal medicine or a four-year. Um, it typically means that you're going to work a lot more hours than other non-surgical fields. And again, this is generalizing and there are differences, but you can count on if you choose a surgical residency, you're going to work 80 plus hours almost every week, where I have plenty of non-surgical counterparts that are pulling 50 in residency, I think it's pretty normal. This guy, no. it, it's just, it, it's, it's a lifestyle consideration for sure. Um, but outside of the lifestyle, I think surgery versus non-surgery, I was also thinking about, um, you know, how much of a proceduralist do I want to be? How much do I care to work with my hands or to really kind of fix something and then send people on their way? That's really kind of the surgeon motto, if you will. We don't love to see patients back and back and back for the same problem happens sometimes in our fields, but that's not what we like. We like to have a problem, fix it with our hands, send them on their way. And for them and for us, probably hope to never see them again. Um, that's not what other non-surgical doctors sometimes enjoy. If you want to be a family medicine doctor where you see this patient back every year to just see how things are going and work up anything if it happened in the meantime, surgery is probably not for you. Um, but that was kind of me going in surgery versus non-surgery as part of my journey. I'm sure as we go back and forth, Eric, we can kind of explain how our, our med school journey um, was influenced by some of these like decision points. But I think surgery versus non-surgery is super important. How was that kind of for you? Yeah, I mean, I know that dichotomy. It's interesting that that is that is your decision point because I know that dichotomy exists. Um, 
And I tried to like fit myself into one side or the other. Mm -hmm. Um, and I just wasn't really able to do it. Um, I, you know, I tried really hard to say for, for a long time, because I think I came in wanting to do surgery. And so I was like, I'm going to be a surgeon and that's it. And I like did all these surgical fields and none of them were really for me, but it wasn't because it was surgery. If that makes sense. Mm -hmm. Um, it was just because they didn't hold as much interest for me. Um, and so, you know, I ended up trying out a bunch of different specialties, kind of one of the blessings of the school that I went to was we had a decent amount of kind of elective time at the end, um, really halfway through a third year on. So we started our, our core rotations early. And so I, um, you know, did some, did some surgical rotations and I just, you know, the hours were not great, but it was not really about the hours. It was just, I wasn't very excited about being there. Um, and so I, you know, was, I feel like there were a billion, a billion like little decision points that went into my decision of what I wanted to pursue. And so, um, but, but, you know, to answer your question, I, I don't feel like the medicine surgery dichotomy really helped me. And that's, you know, partially why I bring up these other two, because I felt like they were more beneficial in me figuring out what I liked and what I didn't like than surgery versus medicine. You know, a lot of people will say, once you go into the OR, you'll know, you know, either you love the OR, or you hate the OR. And I was like, I like the OR. Okay. But I, you know, I didn't love it. I didn't hate it. <laughs> I just <laughs> felt very medium on the whole thing. And so it came down to kind of different, different decision points than medicine or surgery. And, and, you know, maybe that's highlighted in the specialty that I chose. You know, I think, I think probably everyone would agree that dermatology is not like a surgical field, but we do some procedures. Um, there are, you know, as we talked about Mohs surgery, which is not necessarily what I'm going into, but the option is there to do more procedures if you want. Um, and so you know, I think, I think I stood on the fence and maybe leaned medicine and that's kind of where I ended up. <laughs> but again, there were a lot of other, a lot of other kind of things that were balancing. Honestly, I feel like what, um, one of the things that kind of started me off and played a part in where I ended up was, was what I did in my undergrad, which is funny because when I started medical school, I was like clean slate. <laughs> I'm just going to, I'm going to figure out what I like, you know what I mean? But in my undergrad, I did, um, I did molecular biology for my my degree program, and I did a lot of cancer related research, <clears throat> some in radiation oncology, some in immunotherapy, um, some in like cancer bio. And I just really liked cells. Like I my my and this is really going way back, but my first major was neuroscience, and then I was like, no, I started with biochemistry because I really liked chemistry in high school. And then I was like, no, the brain's really cool. Like neuroscience is it. And then I did some research. I did some cell bio research and I was like, cell biology is really cool. Like I actually really like this. I'm not just saying like the brain is cool. I'm like, I'm doing cell biology right now in real time. And it's awesome. And so I did all this research in my undergrad that was cell bio based and kind of car cancer biology based. But I did all this cancer biology stuff and ultimately like, I just really liked cells and I liked learning about cells. And when I got into medical school, we started doing, you know, you do your like basic science blocks and we went through, you know, for example, cardiopulmonary physiology. I remember I had a classmate who was like, man, this, he wanted to be an anesthesiologist and he, he matched anesthesia. But I remember he was like, this cardiopulmonary stuff, like, this is so awesome. And I was like, yeah, I guess it's cool. Cause like it keeps you alive, but <laughs> as far as like pumps and gas exchange, like, I don't know. It's not really for me. But then when we did like the immunology stuff and the T cells, like that stuff was really cool to me. And so, you know, I don't think I really put this together until after I was already applying to dermatology. But like, ultimately, there were things that I liked and things that I didn't like that I started seeing in undergrad and then were kind of reinforced during those preclinical years, which is a time I think that we don't usually think about like, this is going to help me decide on my specialty. And I certainly wasn't thinking it at the time, but there were things that I liked. And in, in dermatology, I guess I should, I should close the loop here that in dermatology, there's a lot of, you know, cell based understanding, you know, the skin is so available 
for biopsy and pathological analysis and histo histoanalysis that we know a lot about pathogenesis of diseases in the skin. We know a lot about how, you know, cytokines and, you know, immune cells interact with the environment and, you know, how infections get started and how vasculitis works because of the, the, the volume of information we get from all these skin biopsies. And so like that stuff is interesting to me. And I didn't put that together until I did a dermatology rotation. And like, I went to some of the lectures and I was like, man, this is like, this is hidden home for me, you know? Yeah. And so that kind of, I think, I think we have interests that we don't just have to start over when we get to medical school and say, I'm going to learn about, you know, neurosurgery because it's awesome. And it is, but like, you can think about the things that you, you know, maybe you did neuro neuroscience in undergrad or, you know, maybe, I don't know, maybe you were an engineer and you really like pumps and physics and like maybe cardiology or, or pulmonology is for you because there's a lot of physics in the ICU is what I've learned in the last month. Mm. I think those things, you know, don't necessarily have to play into your decision, but can be a good starting point of like, what are the things I've been interested in the past? Because that could play into things I'm interested in, in the future and the things that I want to, that I want to continue to learn about. I don't know. Did you have anything like that? Or did you, did you start fresh? <laughs> no, I, you probably don't remember this, Eric. Um, I vividly remember this though. It was our last year in college and we were in the life sciences building together. We were discussing like getting into med school and you had brought up that you thought most surgery was super fascinating when, you know, we were talking to each other about where we would see our future going and you had some other interests as well that you had brought up, but it's funny that full circle, you came back to it. And I remember telling you that I was interested in ENT um, and that maybe we could work together as far as like most okay. surgery and stuff. And, and here we are. Okay. So I, to Eric's point, I think original interest going into medical school can be very powerful. Um, I think med school is a great time to find new interests as well. And you may certainly find something that you never knew you enjoyed simply because your undergraduate experience maybe didn't provide you that, whether you just found something else or it wasn't available. Like our undergrad didn't really have a medical institution linked with it. So a lot of medicine we didn't really get exposed to, but I think it can be a great starting point. And I think what Eric's trying to tell us here is enjoying the the uh, science behind what you do or the blending your interests with the medical specialty can be a really great way to think about what you want to do long term. Um, and so that's like another nugget of advice. Uh, I think I would also add, I would love to hear your thoughts on this as well, Eric. I think I found that something helpful, really choosing a field where I enjoyed the bread and butter of it was important in deciding what I wanted to do long term. So I came in originally thinking ENT, but I jumped off the train for orthopedic surgery and thoracic surgery. And it wasn't until my third year where I was able to try out all three of those specialties, like back to back to back. Uh, sorry, it was my second year as a, a clinical rotation, because just like you, Eric, we had, you know, second year was for our core rotations. And I realized I loved orthopedic surgery because I loved orthopedic oncology. But I realized that that's not very common to practice as your entire practice and that you're going to have to love doing joints. <laughs> you're going to have to love doing uh, amputations. You're going to have to love doing um, fractures of hips and stuff like that. And seeing that, made me realize like I may love orthopedic oncology, but in reality to have a practice, I'm going to have to do a lot of other stuff. That's not that. And I did not enjoy those aspects of orthopedic surgery. And I had already done a lot of research in this. So it was hard for me to walk away from that. But then I went to thoracic surgery too. I was really interested and I'm like, I loved some of the big like heart procedures that they did and big um, lung resections. But I realized that 80% of what I'd be doing would be doing a simple lobectomy. And I hated doing those. Or I, I wouldn't say I hate, that's a strong word, but I didn't really get super excited by that. Yeah. 
And then I went to ENT and I'm like, I, I loved doing tonsils. I loved doing ear tubes. I loved, uh, doing basic like cancer work, like a thyroid removal and part of a tongue removal. Like that's all bread and butter ENT. Any ENT can do that. And I'm like, this is, this is it for me. Like I could be happy because 80% of what what I'll be doing, I really, really enjoy, you know? I don't know if you had that experience or yeah, that was yeah that absolutely, was absolutely. I mean, you do you do a biopsy here, you do an excision there, you do a you know you prescribe a steroid here. You see a bunch of patients come back and they look a lot better and they're really grateful. You know, like that's pretty cool if you ask me. You do a little biologic work. You know, we do we do some um, like immune modulator therapies for some of our like more severe psoriasis and eczema cases and patients respond super well. And, you know, we have our, we have our, that's not really what you're asking, but that, that's part of the bread and butter of Derm, in my opinion, yeah. is like patients getting better, being happy with how they look, being happy with the results that they see. And, and I, and I found, you know, you talk about bread and butter and like the part of what I loved about the derm bread and butter was like there's so many ways to treat things and there's you know you have a thyroid tumor like you need i guess you can i was going to say you need surgery like that's the answer but there's like radioactive iodine and stuff like that so maybe that's not a great example but like the point i'm trying to drive across is like in dermatology there's so many different ways of treating things based on severity based on patient preference you know based on drug interactions things like that and so there are even the simple things like you're thinking about and you have to give it some thought. And then again, you see patients get better and it's just, it was very satisfying for me. And I agree with, I actually had the exact same experience with orthopedics, <laughs> not, not the oncology <laughs> part, but I did a rotation and they were like, yeah, you know, hips and hips and knees are okay. And you know, this and that, but like the trauma rotation, that's like, that's so awesome. You're going to love it. And I did two weeks out of my four in trauma. And I was just like, I don't get it. Like, I just don't get it. <laughs> so that's funny that that was your experience. <laughs> you know, it, I think it's easy to get fooled as a med student because like if there's some big, big procedure that's pretty rare, they're going to put you in that. Yeah. Procedure. And that's, that's the thing that I would tack on to what you're saying is like, as, as you start, you know, you might not have all the rotations ultimately that you want and so it is it can be helpful to do shadowing in the Mm -hmm. first year or two but the thing that i would try to seek out in a shadowing experience is to like number one see the bread and butter just Mm -hmm. like you're saying and number two like go for a whole day and see what it's like you know because there's there's a difference between going to like a two and a half hour appendectomy and going to like a full day of general surgery like it's it's different and i have friends who have done a two and a half hours of appendectomy and they applied general surgery and now they're doing it and they're like uh, this is not what i signed up yeah, for you know absolutely. and you know it's not just it's not unique to surgical specialties people see again like i said in dermatology clinics sometimes we see 30 40 patients in a day and if you go to two hours of derm clinic and you're like this is really fun and i saw you know a handful of patients it's different like people can get burnt out seeing so many patients in a day. And I'm not trying to say it's as arduous as, you know, a 20 hour surgery, but it, it's not for some people. Right. And so you have to avail yourself of like, what are these people actually doing day in and day out? You know, take a couple of days, take, take as much time as you can and explore those things that are interesting to you. Because if you go to one surgery or if you go to one clinic day, it's not, it's not going to give you the the data that you need to make an informed decision you know definitely the more you can get your hands in that specialty i think the more informed you become i remember telling my wife at the very first couple days of the ent rotation that i did like i'm not doing this i had a really bad headache one day and i was in clinic all day and i didn't understand the lingo of what was being said and it was really rough and i came home and told my wife that and then Two weeks later, because you know that's that's a reasonable amount of time as a med. So you don't get more than that, to be honest. But you know, my my heart changed because I got much more information to make an informed decision. If I would have gone just off that one day, it would have been not ENT for me. Yeah. So 
if you can get more time, it's helpful. It's hard to know when to finally pull the plug and say, I'm not interested in this. I don't know if I have great advice for that, but I think it's hard as a student. What did your wife say when you told her that this was not it? <laughs> I was still on the ortho train. Um, she was like, great, do ortho. <laughs> yeah, she's like, do ortho. <laughs> but yeah, I. she didn't say much. She was super supportive, like, okay. <laughs> I, don't know, I don't know what your wife did was like during this process yeah, just just support it and yeah you know, it's such a big decision but i feel like they don't want to like influence over influence you and it's just tough i do want to throw out to our listeners it is a big decision it has implications on a good chunk of years of your life but i can tell you 10 different people right off the top of my head who have switched after it's not pleasant. Nobody would say you should go in thinking you should switch, but it's not the end of the world. There are true and honestly, people, yeah, go ahead. I was just going to say it gives you it gives you a really unique skill set. Like we have a guy right now who's an emergency resident who did a year of surgery residency and he's like the yeah. best resident I've worked with because he has this year of surgical experience which is it's like priceless in my opinion. Yeah. Based on what I've seen from him, he's just, he's really impressive, you know? And so having that background from somewhere else, I think can be, can be really beneficial. Oh, cool. Definitely. So it's not the end of the world, but hopefully thinking through some of the things we've talked about so far could be helpful. I guess to summarize so far, we've talked about thinking about the bread and butter and not just getting fooled by the, the cool stuff that comes through. We've talked about, you know, surgery versus non-surgery can be helpful for some people, but not all people. And it has some implications um, to think about. We've talked about... um, Sick versus not sick. Sick versus not sick and settings of where you want to practice. And then also really thinking about what your interests are, what your background is, and having a, a step up, I guess going into medical school with some of those interests. Yeah. What, uh, what final takeaways do you have for us, Jaden? I would say, you know, a lot of our listeners are probably in the last year to two of college. And so they'll be in these shoes very soon. I think having a strong curiosity early on and, and emphasizing that could really help them to use some of these forks in the road to find where they best fit. If you're curious, you're going to do a lot of shadowing. You're going to see a lot of different things that will help make you have an informed decision. You'll be thinking about things past, like what are the cool cases? You know, you'll be curious to know what the bread and butter is and So I think that attribute really ties into a lot of what we're seeing. Um, They say, you know, have an open mind. I think that's also in a similar, it's a similar phrase for what I'm trying to get across here. If, If you're curious, you will have an open mind. You'll take every rotation seriously because it may be the last time you ever get to do such things, you know, and to your point, some of these skills are, invaluable if you bring them to another field you know if you really take ob seriously and you don't have no plan on going into ob that will help you in dermatology it will help you in ent so that's what i have what do you think eric any last takeaways yeah i wholeheartedly agree and it's funny now that i'm in the icu and the icu attendings will be like Let's talk about the hard lung machine and like, what are you going into again? And I'll be like, dermatology, and they're like, okay, <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> but it is, but I mean, it's helpful. Like, you know, it's, it's important to know because, you know, I'll be called to the ICU when I get to my residency program and it's helpful to know what's going on with these patients. Um, the advice that I would have, um, to close out would be, um, that I think I was, I came into school with the impression that like there was a specialty that I needed to find Mm. that was going to be the specialty for me. And, uh, that didn't happen. Um, and I found myself being influenced a lot by 
you know, friends that I had and what they were interested in. Um, and like really trying to want one specific specialty versus another and like wanting to be, wanting to feel the, the call, you know what I mean? Ugh. Such a stressful time. And I just, maybe that's the case for some people. And if that happens to you, that's awesome and go with it, you know, but I think for a lot of people, that's just not the case. And for me, I think I could have chosen one of 10 specialties that I can think of, and I would have been happy doing them and I would have loved it, you know? So at the end of the day, I think as I have kind of alluded to, like, I took a lot of data points into consideration when I was deciding what I wanted to do. And I think that sometimes that's just what you need to do. You know, you have to be analytical and, and gather the data and make a decision um, and, you know, find something that you would enjoy and, and can see yourself doing in the long term. But um, I guess I just wish that someone had told me that I didn't have to like sample everything until I found the one thing. Cause mm -hmm. I tried to do that and it didn't really happen. And I think that was frustrating for me for a long time was trying to find that one thing. And, and ultimately, like I said, I mean, there's so many like beautiful and interesting and impactful things that you can do in medicine. And honestly, you could do, obviously you could do any specialty and people do any specialty every day of the year and everyone loves what they do. Maybe not everyone, but people find joy and fulfillment in every specialty in medicine. And so, you know, it just takes kind of the right perspective and, and um, finding something that you feel like you can do and going with that. And yeah, like, like I said, I, I think, I think it can be a lot of things. Um, but I would, you know, listen to yourself. Don't let people tell you what to do and try to be, try to be true to what you think, um, you need to be doing in the long term. I don't know. That sounds a little bit cheesy now that it's coming out of my mouth, but that's honestly, <laughs> that's honestly my perspective. <laughs> I couldn't agree more with that, Eric. There's been so many times this year where I've been on rotations it's not my specialty and i thought i i could have been happy doing this too yeah. you know so and and it is really hard to tune out some of those voices and influences in this journey you know you might find somebody who you really like who's a an attending or a professor at your school and they want you to do what they do this is naturally you know when you talk to people you get excited about what you do and it's it's good to hear, but ultimately you got to do what feels best for you. I remember it being very challenging to tell one of my core mentors I was not going into thoracic surgery. And uh, he was super supportive. And I think most people are in this journey. Yeah, absolutely. So. Well, good stuff, Jaden. Thanks for your thoughts. Thanks for being here with me. Thank and, you, too. Uh, let's let's do this again soon. Absolutely. Bye, guys. <laughs> <laughs>